Hi, I'm S.A. Baz Collins for this week's Written on the Edge, Season 8, Episode 31, Friday Interview. We'll be getting to know Juliet Kemp better and talking about their recent release, The City Reveal. So let's welcome our guest. There you go. There's the book cover. Woo! Juliet Kemp is a queer non binary writer. They live in London by the river with their partner's kid and dog. Their first book of their fantasy series, The Deep and Shining Dark, was on the Locust 2018 recommended readings list. And the fourth and final book, The City Revealed, came out at the start of 2023. Their short fiction appeared in venues including Uncanny, Analog, A Cast of Wonders, and they were shortlisted for the WSFA Small Press Award of 2020. When not writing or child wrangling, Juliet knits, indulges their fountain pen habit, and tries to fit an ever-increasing number of plants into a microscopic back garden. Juliet, welcome to the show. Hi, it's good to be here. So tell us, uh, you know, how you got started in this uh, wacky business we call writing. Um, well, I, I wrote a lot as a kid. Um, I have a lot, lot of memories of writing all sorts of things. I, I even sent something off to a publisher when I was like 13 and got a very uh, nice letter back. This was back in the days when I'm doing like <laughs> physically a stack of paper um, right. in the post. Um and then I stopped in my teens uh, for a bit because other ac academic stuff and I, mean, I was doing a lot of music and social like all these things took over. And then about 10 years later, I was like, I really, I really miss that. I really wish I was doing more of it. So I kind of, I, I uh, wrote a couple of short stories and sent one of them off and it got accepted like by a non-pay venue, but still accepted first time out, which uh, has never happened to me since. <laughs> right, right. Time, Enjoy those like, when they oh, happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but at the time, I was like, "Wow, this is amazing!" Uh, so that was that was very uh, um, I, I was inspiring, I guess. Like it, it felt really good. So I very sort of very slowly started writing more. Um, wrote a couple of novels, which I trunked. Wrote some more short stories for like little anthologies and kind of token pay venues and then semi pro venues. Had a baby in the middle of that, which did kind of slow everything down. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, and, and then uh, I wrote The Deep and Shining Dark. Again, it was it took me a couple of, at least a couple of years, maybe three, before I had something that I wanted to send to people um, and uh, started sending it to agents and to a couple of small presses and elsewhere and accepted it, which uh, was uh, a glorious moment. I had the flu when I got the email, though. So I was like, I remember lying in bed thinking, really? Um, I had to get my partner <laughs> in to read the email. <laughs> am, I, am I imagining this? It's really what it's Right, right, right. Um, so yeah, that was uh, brilliant and also very scary because I was like, people are going to read this. That's, that's really scary. <laughs> or they won't read that. And that's really scary. Too. My child is out in the world. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, but it was great. And I was, I was thrilled when that was say on the Locus, uh, Locus recommended reads list. That was brilliant. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, since then, that was 2018 that it came out. And I've since then, I've written another, I've written a couple of novellas. I've written the rest of that series, um, which is, it's it's been really enjoyable writing it. I'm, I've really enjoyed spending that much time in the world. Uh, book two did come out on the day that the UK went into lockdown during the pandemic, which I don't recommend. <laughs> like, that was not ideal. Um, but the... Uh, uh, but it's it's been it's been lovely sort of hearing from people who've read it and all that culture kind of thing. And I've had more short stories accepted over that time as well. Um so yeah, that's and that's where I've got to now. Okay. Well tell us about your recent release, The City Revealed. Yep, this is this one. I'm yeah. gonna blur out. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um it's uh, yeah, it's I made some notes because I can never I can never answer this off the top of my head. <laughs> it's a book. <laughs> I read the book, it's got words in. It like, has pages and you flip uh -huh. them like this. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's the fourth and final book in the Marek series. Um, although uh, the fantasy author Juliet 
um, who blurbed it for me, um, read it without reading the previous ones to see what happened and said she reckons you can start there if you want. Obviously, I encourage oh. you to read all of them. Um, right. But you can start You can start in the, at the end. Um, so, yes, me. I, this, it's set in the city of, of Marek, um, which in this book is newly independent and under threat. Um, my, one of my main characters, Marcy, is uh, heavily pregnant, very fed up, um, and trying to warn people about the threat whilst nobody believes her. And she's about to fall out very dramatically with her sorcerer brother, Cato. Uh, meanwhile, there's revolution brewing in the rest of the city. And during the course of the book, all the problems crash neatly into one another. Um, right. And then I hope I wrap them up successfully. Well, what should readers so know it's about a lot the of, uh, series? Um, it's secondary world fantasy. Um, I okay. keep wanting to call it urban fantasy because it's set in a city, but that isn't what urban fantasy means, unfortunately. This is right. like it is a um, <laughs> urban a fantasy. City. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's it's the the world is kind of uh, they've got printing presses, um, but you know it's not you haven't got any kind of the up to date tech that kind of it's that sort of era of world. Uh, okay. It's queer norm, um, and it's a the, one of the things I'm really interested in is is uh, where things like family, loyalties, politics, and magic all collide together. Um, it's it's been described as uh, eminently satisfying and richly imagined, both of which were things I was very pleased about by the people <laughs> who said that. Um, and the other thing I guess to know about it is I think we might talk about this later in the uh, podcast, but I'm really interested in trying to write stories where people solve problems without the kind of fantasy uh big battle with a big sword sort of climax uh <laughs> i've read i'm not that i'm not into that as well but the I, i'm kind of really interested in solving problems without people smacking each other with things <laughs> um so so i guess that's the other thing about the series that i'm it's I'm trying to get people i'm trying to write different sorts of different ways to get around problems including quite serious problems Ah, excellent. And lots Sounds of people like argue with each other. Well, yeah, <laughs> as as things want to do, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um. So, what what can if if I were at a book fair and you were there and I walked up to you and, and asked you what was it about? How would you do the elevator pitch kind of thing to get me interested in the book? Um. Political fantasy with uh, magic, complicated family loyalties, um, and a uh, chaotic neutral trans sorcerer. Okay, okay, there you go. Now we just need that on a billboard so people know about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, you know, it's interesting because um, now the character, the main character, how do they identify? And is it a, is it a, um, a thing in your world to have to identify? No, one of the things I wanted to do was to to make that not um, important. You know, that's not quite the right way to put it, but uh, say it's it's queer norm in the sense of of the different sorts of relationships and different sorts of identity um, are thing. unremarkable. They just they just yeah. exist. Just not a thing. Um, so, for example, say my uh, trans sorcerer Cato. Um, has been disowned by his family, but he's been disowned by well, his mother specifically. Um, but he's been disowned because of the magic, nothing to do with the gender or anything else. Um, and his sister Marcia, who is is still in touch with him, um, sort of somewhat quietly, uh, the she gets into a relationship with a sorcerer, which again is it causes trouble. But is, the trouble is because people in her sort of political position are not supposed to be involved with magic not because they are the other sorcerer is a woman so uh, um so okay. that's uh there are lots of people who identify in lots of different ways and different sorts of you know relationships and different genders but that's 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 i very much wanted to write something where that was never the source of conflict excellent I, lots I of other conflicts right 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 we've got child we've got too much on the plate already <laughs> yeah yeah exactly that's not one of them <laughs> Um, and right. somebody, I never thought about this when I was writing it, actually, but somebody point, or not didn't think about it in, you know, out, out loud, you know what I mean? But somebody right. um, mentioned to me a while back that to some extent the conflicts around magic and the way the 
sort of social position of magic and how though that sort of conflict works is in some ways almost standing in for the for other sorts of discrimination right i was gonna so say that's, that's one of the big sources of conflict where the other things aren't right and and i think what that does is it really kind of puts the queer normative that you're putting out as saying see it's like this is what you're doing it's over there but we're we can still in our world apply mm. it to this too you know so that's a really great way to kind of bring it all up without really being in the in their face about it when they're reading it you know yes as i say i don't think i was i don't i wasn't doing that consciously but i'm happy to uh, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. So unconsciously i think clearly i'm working through some stuff here <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah i'll take it <laughs> <laughs> all right so what challenges have you faced uh and potential wisdom have you gained writing as a non-binary author writing non-binary characters and this is of particular interest to me because um, I think as a binary identifying person, I want to kind of respect that part. And I kind of would like to learn what, because here, here's what my take is as far as the problematic situations I see as a writer myself in writing a non-binary. What I don't want, because I think some people would think, oh, well, you don't identify as either. Well, then is that like make you less interesting because that's you know what i mean it's like they kind of see is it as, almost as a bleeding out of of the binary which i get i mean i understand the, the position of non-binary people but i'm trying to figure out how do you write that so that you're respectful of the community but at the same time you're making it accessible to those who may not understand it do you know what i mean um yeah that's interesting. I think for myself, I tend not to write stories where that's a kind of where where that experience of identity is particularly a driving aspect of plot. It's more just so it's just it is. It's just it is, which and obviously character, you know, characters' experience of gender and things like that influences who they are. But um, I'm I don't think I've yet anyway written a story where that's um sort of up, where that's more than just part of their, their background experience um right. and in a world where there isn't that kind of discrimination around gender or gender identity um it has a different impact um from how it would if you're writing something set in this world right here today um right. and i should i mean when i started writing the series i don't i I was trying to think back on this, like the timeline. I don't think I actually identified as non-binary when I started writing it, although I did by the time it was published, because I remember emailing my publisher about my correct pronouns and feeling really nervous and scared about it. So it must have been quite soon after mm -hmm. I'd come out. Mm -hmm. um, and it was fine, obviously. I wasn't nervous because I was concerned about my publisher. It's just scary coming out. <laughs> like, right, right. Is that, well, is that it is, era? no matter when you do um, it, you know. <laughs> Mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. never stop um, that's the problem <laughs> well that's the thing like i've been out i've been out as bisexual for decades now that like, that's really old and then it's like oh god i've got to do this again again great <laughs> fucking me <laughs> this wasn't on uh, my bingo but... card <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and i guess to some extent maybe i was um it, it's possible that some, you know some of what I've been writing and the way I've written characters through that has been part of working my own stuff out. Um, and I wrote a novella just before uh, the novel series uh, started coming out, which nobody has gender at all. There's no there's no gender pronouns, and that was very much I wrote that in a because I was feeling very cross about the existence of gender in any way, <laughs> shape, or right. form. Well, well I kind of want to give you a situation to get to highlight why I posed the question the way I did. I was watching, well, my family was watching the Super Bowl of of queerdom uh, here in the States, uh, the Tony Awards, which was the celebration of everything on Broadway. And Alex Newell was up for a, and there were a lot of queer performers who were self-identifying in different ways. And it was really wonderful to see the spectrum fully represented. Um, but my sister, now, mind you, she has two queer brothers. Um, she's grown up, you know, and, you know, all, surrounded by queer people, you know, she, so she's not like she's outside of the community much, you know, she, ha I have a lot of queer friends, so does my brother. So 
we have, you know, she's been around the community all her life. And yet when watching it, Alex Newell went up to accept their award and they identify as non-binary. And my sister turned to me, she said, can I ask you a question? And I said, what? And she said, well, if they're non-binary, how, how do I refer to them uh, it, with respect? I don't want to say something wrong. So how does it work? And after peeling back the layers of that question, mm. one of the things she was struggling with is that she kept thinking she had to replace, and I know it's going to sound a little silly, but it, it revealed to me the level of complexity that I think cisgender people apply to this situation, and they don't really realize they're kind of overthinking it. She thought she had to replace the pronoun with their proper name. <laughs> so that they were like, oh, right. Amy, yes. I, you know, so, and, and, and mm. she was just trying to figure out how do I use it? So I had to explain to her the singular form of they, and, you know, and I, so mm. I told her, you know, grammatically it's correct, you know, and, but she goes, but can I say their name? I said, yes, absolutely. They're, they're still Alex. They're still, you know, but yeah. that I think is the part of it is mm. that they think, oh, mm. it's new territory. I don't want to do it wrong. But at the same time, I'm not quite sure like what, what, what do I not say? Or, you know, and this is someone who's respectful of the community at large. Mm. So, you know, but it kind of revealed to me. And is asking how, the questions actually. That's, yeah. You know, yeah. How her. deep the problem <laughs> goes, you know? And so that's yeah. why I'm interested in, you know, with you writing characters like this, I, you know, and, and I guess making it queer norm probably is a good way to do it because it kind of takes that, oh, overthinking it out of, out of the box. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I mean, personally, to my my kind of feeling about gender largely is no thank you. Um, so to some extent, I'm kind of, de you know, deliberately not writing in, you know, there are people who are much more interested in how gender, you know, how gender works right, and how, right, right. you know, and thinking about it. And I'm more interested in not thinking about it. <laughs> right, right, uh, Which is, right. you know, a very personal position. Um, but actually, I think we're in a place where writing about this stuff or thinking about it is all quite new it's obviously non-binary people and people of compl you know, complicated genders have been around forever but right. reading books which in which people have singular they pronouns or near pronouns or are on the pages non-binary is like that wasn't I, ne I don't remember reading any of that until fairly recently um Again, not saying it wasn't there, but it's become right. like there's more of it now. And and so I think we're still in a place where people are working out in some ways how to do this. And I've, you know, I, I've had a discussion. I've occasionally had discussions with editors about sort of the not quite the grammatics of singular. They thankfully we're past that. But um, <laughs> about kind of ways of referring to people on the page um, where, again, it's sometimes been slightly overthinking. Um, and that's fine. I'm happy to have those discussions and to to sort of talk through how I've chosen to make it work in this world or how it works in, in the real world. Um, but I've also had discussions where I've had somebody say, well, why don't you just use, you know, singular day is very untidy. Why don't you just use neo pronouns? And I'm like, well, I am also here for neo pronouns. I think they're great. But if nearly works, everyone yeah. I know in, yeah, nearly everyone I know in person who's non-binary in the real world uses they at this at, at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of want to write that. <laughs> Because <laughs> like, right. that's no, what's happening. No, I get it. Mm -hmm. um, I, but I think that having those conversations, like like the one with your sister, is kind of still going on, and it's also still going on on the page. And one of the reasons I'm keen to write more non-binary characters is to make to, so it becomes more normal, more like so that people do encounter it. Like, oh, this is how you can, this is how you, do, or this is a way of doing that. That makes sense. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, because like, you know, my clubbing days back in the 80s, um, you know, it was presented as typically that you would say you were androgynous, you had this androgyny kind of angle mm -hmm. to your personality. And I certainly expressed that. Um, but I never saw it in the terms, you know, it's kind of like, I think it's really cool, to be honest with you, that we have the representation now out there and in front. I love the idea. Because I think, what non-binary does in many respects, it allows you to be playful with life. I mean, it allows, it actually opens up doors in my mind rather than penning everybody in nice, neat little mm. boxes, you know? And so I, and I almost see that the non-binary kind of identity is really probably the most emblematic of queerdom 
by and large, because it is, for me, it's a freeing concept. You know, it's like, you don't have to do this or this, you know, you have a much broader palette to play with, you know, and I love yeah. that. And I think sometimes there's a risk of turning into like three boxes instead of two when I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not really here for that. Like, let's, let's. Right, let's right. No, no, exactly. Let's, like, Just wipe it off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lots of things all at once. Yeah, right. Exactly. Everything, everywhere, all at once. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Precisely. Um, but yeah, so the, the more of that there is out there, the more that people are, write, are writing that and creating other forms of entertainment, I think the better. Okay. Well, are there any other ways you challenge the cultural and genre expectations? Mm. Um, yeah, I mentioned earlier that uh, I, I've, you know, I, I, a lot. There's a there's a kind of set of fantasy tropes around your kind of, you know, your single hero, hero, heroine, with a big sword, building to a big battle, or some variation thereof. Right, and right. obviously, don't get me wrong, I flip in love a big sword and a set piece big battle. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also interested, uh, as you know, a uh, an old hippie, um, in <laughs> in sort of finding other ways of uh, solve, uh, looking at other ways of solving problems. Because I do uh, sort of believe that one of the things stories do is give us ways to think about the world. Mm -hmm. um and if you're always reading stories that are about kind of conflicts and about conflicts that build in a particular way that i think that tends that that can tend to lead to you to, to people putting those uh, models uh onto the real world as well um like i think you know humans think in stories um and so i think trying to have you know more sorts of stories to think with uh is is a positive thing so i'm very interested Plus, in fresher. writing other ways of solving conflict. Right. Yes, I mean it's, 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 it's fun to write. It's fun, yeah, yeah, it's fun to write as well. And there are there are definitely other people writing those sorts of stories. But I'm very into that. But it can be really hard, especially in the the most recent book, the fourth book. I kept I was sort of sitting there drafting it, and I kept finding myself kind of steering towards like some kind of big climactic battle. Like that's what the shape. And I was like, no, no. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Rewind. <laughs> Rewind. Try again. Um, and there is, you know, it does, the book does have a sort of uh, fate, you know, showdown and there is, you know, a sort of big, uh, there is a sort of big climax. finish in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. An epic climax, thank you. Uh, but it's not one with kind of, you know, lots of people hitting each other and lots of blood. I wanted to find a way of negotiating around the problem. I'm interested in people having to work with people that they don't like um and those kind of complicated negotiations where you you're working to solve a problem that you have in common even if that person o over there is you know it's, your nemesis yeah it, it's decade. what we should strive but for actually, more this in this world in time, exactly yeah, yeah yeah so i'm interested in writing all of that but it is quite it is quite challenging sometimes because my you know i've read a lot of stories and my brain has been shaped by those stories um, and that's one of the, you know, writing outside that can be really hard in the same way that when I first started writing, um, you're talking about non-binary to skip back to that. The first time that I drafted the first book, it had one non-binary character in who is uh, the city angel, who's like a non-human sort of magical mm -hmm. character. And then I read through the draft and I was like, why are none of the humans, why are all <laughs> the humans binary gendered? <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it, you find out how much so, of it you know, is ingrained that, in yeah, society when just, it gets like that. Yeah, and it's like inside your own head, like what the hell? Um, so, you know, I fixed I fixed that in the second draft. Um, and over the course of the book, I introduced more things. Um, but more, sorry, more, I introduced more other things that I wanted to see in it because I've been, um, I keep thinking about those, about those norms and those expectations and how much of them are built into myself. Uh, like, for example, this whole the tendency to write for fantasy again to be more about sort of, you know, nobles and people at the top of society and less about um, the rest of society. Uh, and I was sort of thinking about that and I'm like, I've, I've, I've kind of done that a bit, haven't I? <laughs> so in the later books, I've delivered. <laughs> um, and, you know, as, as a sort of, you know, 
lifelong anarchist. <laughs> I was, it's, you find yourself like I'm, I'm writing about you know this, and that's not entirely true. Like the even the first book has uh, people in different parts of the city and different sort of social strata. But um, you know, my one of my main characters is one of the sort of people who runs the city. Um, and so in the later books, I was like, I want to write more about um, the you know people in the sort of lower city, if you like. Um, and, and I, at that point, I was like, I, I want a revolution. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Good old class warfare. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exa no, exactly. I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go there. I've got uh, you know people challenging how the city is being run and forcing my you know noble character to actually stop and think for herself about like what is it that i'm doing here and do i want it to be that way um but right. it was almost surprising to me when that I, that I hadn't done more of that from the start because again these these sort of ideas of who you write stories about and how you write stories uh are so kind of ingrained um that you have to do the work to sort of dig them out no so it's, I been, love it's that. been an interesting ride <laughs> yeah I, no i love that i think that's brilliant lovely so what's up next for you? And where's the best place for people to follow you to find out what you're doing? Um, to people to follow me, I have a newsletter, which people can sign up to on my website, which is julietkemp.com. Um, I am still on Twitter uh, at, as Juliet K, but what's going on currently with Twitter? Who knows? Um, and I'm on right. Mastodon um, at uh, Juliet at zerk.us. So all of those places, the newsletter is probably best to be honest. No threads uh, account yet. I had, uh, there's so many. I, can't I know, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I get it. Just everybody's going on about threads now. I'm like, really? We're yeah, going to yeah. go to Zuckerberg? <laughs> yeah, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Um, but yes, up next, I hopefully have two novellas out this year, um, both from different small presses, but I'm not wholly sure when yet. We are Both of them are in the final edit stage, and I've seen a cover for one of them, which is really awesome. Um, so I will be announcing those when I know what's happening. Um, but fingers crossed this year. Okay. Um, and I'm currently working on a novel in a completely different world um, from the Marek ones, um, which... Uh, is slightly kicking my ass at the moment, but we'll get there. Um, <laughs> I <I've... laughs> you love your muses I've... when they post these things to you. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I've just I've just had a bunch of notes from a dear friend who's done a sort of alpha read for me, and I'm like, yep, you're right, and that, yep, all right, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm plowing back on into that one, and yeah, we'll see when that's ready. Uh, I I keep thinking end of the year. We'll see. Um, and I have a short story coming out in the the Future Fire, which is an online magazine um, that should be out, I think, in October. Um, and I'm recording an interview for another podcast in a fortnight, Ali Baker's Fantasy Book Swap, um, which is at uh, alibaker 68podbeancom So that should be fun as well. I was talking about a couple of books. I choose one and Ali chooses one and we talk about them. Oh, lovely. Excellent. So yeah, that's that's what I'm up to. But all of that can be tracked at Juliet Kemp, right? Dot com. Ju Juliet Kemp dot com is right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Best place. We'll yeah, make sure we include all those links in our show notes as well. All right. Um, so anything else you want to share that you can think of? I don't think don't so. Have. No. It's okay. been great fun. All right. Um, well, We'd like to extend a huge thank you to Juliet Kemp. Uh, we at Written on the Edge are proud to introduce you to new media by queer content creators. If you enjoy learning about new artists or hearing our thoughts on entertainment media, please like and subscribe so you can get alerts for the new episodes. This show is produced by Rogue Ravens Media. For our disclaimers, links to social media, our listen stations, or to sign up as a guest, visit www.ropepodcast.com. Tune in next week for your queer media fix. Closing time. Bums rush and melody, dear. <laughs> <laughs>